Welcome to The Thinking Tree, a podcast to help believers renew their minds and reform their hearts. I'm Adam Sanchez. And I'm Jeff No. And today we are discussing Christians in media. All right, we're back here with another episode of The Thinking Tree. And today, a very interesting topic, one that we have not shied away from for many years. It's true. Yep. We've talked about this one going back to the underground, uh, our old legacy TV, YouTube <laughs> TV right. show from COVID yep. uh, times. Uh, but today we want to talk about Christians in media and specifically we're looking at uh, Christians in popular culture media, not just the nature of Christians in, you know, music or other forms of media, right. uh, but, but really specific here. So we have a question and then we'll, we'll work it out. Uh, the question for today is how should Christians think about and respond to supposed Christian leaders in media. I like the way you said supposed. I got to show the <laughs> hand there. I got to show it. Right. And the rub on this question is that we assume that if somebody has a public platform, that they must be a leader of some capacity, right. somebody to listen to, somebody to trust. Right. But that doesn't always equate. Not only that, but they even if they say they're Christian, it doesn't always mean they're Christian. And we're going to talk about that, <laughs> right? We're going to talk about that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit of context here in our modern era. It's yep. very unique. If mm -hmm. we think about Christians in the past, to be popular or part of culture, you would have to be published. You would have to have right. some kind of platform to be on. I mean, publish is even still more of a modern thing with the printing press. That wasn't a thing a thousand years ago. That's a thing within the last couple hundred years right. uh, to have been published. But Today, there's such a, a, an immense amount of media surrounding people. I mean, here yeah. we are even, we're podcasting. We have right, this, right. this rig here that, that the, the Alex and uh, Laura and Glenn helped create. You can go back in season one and listen to how that came about. Uh, but we have this immense ability to put thoughts out there. Right. On the, on the interwebs. In our hands, right? Yeah, on the right, interwebs right. and then in the cloud and in our hands, which is insane. Right. But before even podcasts were really a big thing, blogs were a big thing. Mm -hmm. And even writing in articles. And that's kind of really more of the genesis of uh, or the beginning of Christians in more modern media. Right. And th this even goes back to Puritan days mm -hmm. where Christians would write in the newspapers and the local periodicals. Mm -hmm. They would put out thoughts there and they would put out encouraging that this goes back even to the day of Spurgeon. Spurgeon would mm -hmm. write publicly, yeah. write public letters. Yep. Um, even our great Martin Luther yep. uh, was was a letter writer to, right. the, to the public in many yep. ways. So this this history of Christians engaging is not abnormal, but it is super intense these days. It's the proliferation of so many d different types of platforms. And so now, and like you said, anybody with a rig now has a voice. Mm -hmm. That didn't used to be the way it was, right? If you were, if you were preaching in a church, you'd been qualified to do that. Mm. If you were uh, leading a denomination, you'd be qualified to do that. If you were writing a Christian book, usually mm -hmm. the publisher would make sure that you're qualified to do yeah, that. Yeah, some but kind today, of a... Yeah, today it's just, it's a free for all. So that requires greater discernment on our part. And that's the thing, right? right. That's the thing we're going to keep coming back to today. When, when, it, when we look at the landscape today, there are a couple of areas or a couple of places, I would say, where we may be prone to give more uh, leeway to mm -hmm. people that we might not we might we might rethink that after this episode right? <laughs> on some of those one of those and I, and I know I've spoken out about it, I think you have too as well on our on our underground episode just trying to remember yeah. years ago but we've spoken about some of these authors on like the gospel coalition right who may have a platform they may have a voice but we might question whether we should be listening to them right and, and the Gospel Coalition started off well. D.A. Carson was one of the founders. He's mm -hmm. one of the great theologians of our time. Yeah. He's very solid. Uh, and at the time, Tim Keller was his partner in that. And Keller, you know, towards the end of his life, he, he definitely sort of veered off in a funny way. But at the time that the Gospel Coalition was founded, I think you and I and all of our elders, we were like, we love this site. Mm -hmm. There's some great stuff here. And I you know Moeller, Al Moeller was writing for there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole bunch of really solid guys who've written in the past for the Gospel Coalition. But like so many things, over time, they tend to, they tend to veer more liberal. Yeah. And the Gospel Coalition started moving into what we've talked about it here on this um, podcast, the Winsome Movement, mm. right? Yeah. Um, social justice. They started leaning into some things that that sort of perked our ears up and we thought, hmm, 
there's some changes happening over there. Yeah. Like anything that gets watered down over time, yeah. little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? That's the nature of things. They typically don't get sharper. Right. They get worse. They do. Right. And I think that's what you're describing with gospel coalition. There were a lot of really good, helpful resources early on right. from articles that they were writing, even to video series they yeah. were producing. Yeah that were helpful for Christian leaders and Christians in general. And then over the years, it really has seemed to water down. I'll, I'll name another outlet that probably is far more watered down in, in nature and has been over the years, uh, but Christianity Today. Oh, yeah. And that was, I mean, this has its roots back like 30 years ago. Uh, actually, more. 19, more than I, that? I believe it was in the ni- mid-1950s, Billy the Graham. 1950s. Yeah, I didn't even 50s. know it was that old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And get this, Carl Henry was the original editor. Really? So those are Here's some, an education for me now. Yeah, Christian right, right. And Billy Graham. It was the evangelical flagship, you know, periodical that, um, that dominated, I, again, at a time when there wasn't all these different platforms. Yeah. But it's where everybody looked for a time. Now, I'm not that old. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, do you remember those <laughs> days? But you don't have to. No, right, right. <laughs> I just remember growing up, you know, from the from the 80s, basically, Christianity Today was right. the place that Christians would go to for how they should think about things, mm-hmm. how they should think about policies, how they should think about, uh, you know, different world cultural movements. And back then, you know, the like the LGBTQ movement wasn't even an LGBTQ right. movement. It was just how do you think about AIDS and how do you think right. about gay people and right. those kinds of things were the big big deal back then. Yep. How do you deal with your friend who got remarried? And th- those were, the, I mean, really, those <laughs> right, were the right. things Divorce, back then. Right, right. Now yeah. it's very, very different, but oh very watered down. Oh, so it's, when, it's so liberal now. There are now today, there are some authors that are sound trying to give an influence to Christianity today. Right. Uh, like I'll name one of them. Ernie Baker has written oh, has some he? articles hmm. for them, hmm. but that does not mean that the bulk of their articles are sound. It just means that every once in a while, you know, a broken clock can be right twice a day kind of thing. It's like that where there is some. And so we can be thankful that there's a little bit of influence there, but by and large, that, that is just not a helpful one. What about, you know, Christians who are writing for secular news outlets? I know you mentioned Tim Keller. Tim Keller has written for, I think like the Atlantic and the New Yorker. Right. He's written for secular news outlets many times. Right. Um, you know, kind of giving some reasoning to that, that, that secular mind. Yeah, and David French is another big name. Russell Moore. These guys have been. Um, here's the thing: if 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 a, if a periodical like the Atlantic reaches out and wants a, I'm doing air quotes now, a Christian voice, you can guarantee that that Christian voice is not going to be anything that would line up with our mm. brand of what we would call Christian. Otherwise, they wouldn't call them right. Because right. look, you and I are never going to get a call. Anybody who thinks as we do, as yeah. teaches as we yeah. do, who believes in scripture the way we do, is never going to get a call from mm-hmm. the Atlantic. So when you see somebody, this is a Christian perspective in in it in a magazine periodical that you know you know is anti-Christian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that that piece that you're reading is going to be filled with error. So that's interesting, right? To be invited, yeah, by such an outlet. I mean, because the questions that come to my mind is, well, what kind of fellowship are you keeping? Right. To be in that kind of a circle, right. to be welcomed into that dynamic. And then, you know, you have to play by some unspoken number of rules. Sure. You know, don't cross this boundary. Don't cross this line. We talked, you just mentioned about the kind of the welcoming nature yeah. of Gospel Coalition. For those outlets, there's there's an unwritten code that you can't be overly offended. You have to fit the bill. Right. You we, have to play the part. You know what the word we use? Mm. That's called compromise. Mm. You will have to compromise to write for our... So if the LA Times called you or I for a comment on something, we we would immediately go, hold on a second. Wait, what? You know, how, what's going on here? There's an angle. There's a spin. Mm-hmm. We would be immediately skeptical. But these guys, you know, again, that's for them, it's, 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 a, it's a job. They're going to get paid for it. They're going to increase their platform, their power, their influence. So what's a little compromise, right? Why do I need to speak the whole truth? <laughs> right. Can right. I give just a sprinkling of it right. instead of, yeah, instead of dousing them? Because there, look, the, the business model for the Atlantic or any of these magazines, it's to draw eyeballs. So mm-hmm. they're not going to hire somebody who's going to, who's going to write something that's going to turn people away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there you have it. Maybe enough to be intriguing, right? right? Enough to be right. a spectacle, right? Like, Good. oh, you know, what kind of like when you have a zoo and you want to get a new, you know, bunch <laughs> of people in, you get the animal that's exciting, yeah, you know, and so you and build enough spectacle, yeah, get them in the door, but not dangerous, yeah. 
you don't want to bring the whole truth because that might actually impact people. Yeah. Isn't it funny how too, we as Christians, we get excited like, oh, uh, there's a Christian article in, in this magazine, in Time Magazine. We get excited. We almost get amped up like, oh, finally we're Validation. Gonna, yeah. Right? Somebody's going to represent us well. And then we read it and go, oh shoot. Mm-hmm. Nope. Yep. Uh, they didn't do that it again. Wasn't, let's go back to the Bible, right? Like, <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this whole idea of, of even celebrity Christians beyond that of, yeah. you know, Christians who make a platform on YouTube and maybe it started out well-meaning enough with just, I don't know, filming their service or something, right. but then turns into having a, a name and a platform for themselves. Yep. I think there's a danger in making the platform the goal yep. versus what we would say in the context of local church, it's really souls, it's people. Right. Right. When we think about how Paul ministered, we think about the example of Christ, the ultimate example. Mm. It was person by person. It's a personal sacrifice for a person. And yes, it's corporate in overall nature, mm-hmm. but it is person by person. That's how Paul ministered as an example of following Christ. So we follow in those same footsteps, which we're local churchmen, not right. big picture platform guys. Right. Uh, not that there's anything wrong if God were to give a platform, Mm -hmm. but we're not chasing it. I think that's the big thing. When we're talking about Christians in media, there's a danger of just chasing the platform and chasing the name. And again, I would just caution everybody listening, have a skeptical eye at this. When you see somebody that that and oftentimes you you get the immediate sense like ah the, there's something going on here I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this person with this mega platform and um you know maybe he's a pastor maybe he's a conference speaker guy maybe he's part of a worship conglomerate that's a newer thing too mm-hmm. you know Hillsong and Bethel and Elevation all these worship conglomerates yeah. these guys become celebrities yeah and they love the attention right so just be really careful when somebody has a big platform make sure you have scrutinizing eyes mm. don't just don't just swallow everything that's coming out of it because it's big and it's popular. Yeah. Just be really careful. Well, let's, let's keep on that theme yeah. about the dangers. Yeah. Uh, the dangers here. Cause we've, we've discussed a little bit about how Christian leaders may compromise to be in a secular news source, periodical article, something like that. Yep. Uh, there is the, the danger that power and influence have always been corrupting. Always. You mentioned it, wanting to have always. a voice and wanting to have a platform uh, those things, they bring, they bring compromise because we're seeking something other than the truth, right? Something other than truth and love. If we're going to quote Paul out of Ephesians right. four, uh, you mentioned as well that it can, it can be monetarily beneficial. Yes. Uh, there can, there can, money can come along with, uh, promoting even unbiblical views at times, yeah. potentially. Uh, one of the things that came forward in in the book, and we mentioned this book from the beginning as, mm-hmm. as helpful and just giving us some talking points for this leading up to this election season. Uh, but from that book, Shepherds for Sale, one of mm-hmm. the one of the concepts that came forward was that there were many Christian leaders who were funded in some way, maybe mm-hmm. not necessarily their direct pocket book of, you know, I'm going to give you this to say this, maybe not always so bold as that, but sometimes they were given money for their research initiatives for a right, book right. Or, or for a conference that they wanted to hold. And so there was, there was money exchange to be had benefits to promote certain things. Yes. And I think that's one of the dangerous, dangerous components there is uh, when there's money behind anything and there always is. And there, there always is. Then people don't, they don't focus on what is true and right and commendable and honorable. Right. Now they trade, because you can't serve God in money, is what God's word says. They trade what is true and what is honorable for something that's going to meet their own agenda. Yeah. Which at times can be, it can be as simple as, well, you know, we're going to talk about this in the next episode, but as promoting like a COVID-19 vaccine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be something like that where sure. it's, hey, you have this influence, you have this platform, we'll help you out to to get the conference that you want. But can you just give this statement? Right. Can you just encourage people in this way? We, this is this is for their good anyways. So it'll always be wrapped up kind of like the, the serpent did in the garden. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, you'll be all knowing like God is. Right. <laughs> it sounds good for a second. Well, I mean, why did Satan fall? What did Satan want? He wanted power mm-hmm. and influence. Right. He wanted to be like the most high God. Yeah. And so that it's, it's sort of the original sin, you know, it's the original, uh, problem that, and, and it's built into human nature. We know it's our fallen nature. Mm-hmm. And if I have to just look around, you see it, it it's actually, if you look in, the, it's in, in your own us. heart, yeah. you'll see it there too. We love power. We love influence. Um, 
And we love the applause of men. Mm. We just do. And it's something that we talk about a lot at Oak Hill about fighting against that temptation yeah. to say it's about the approval of God, not the approval of others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's the old, the old, the famous saying power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's who we are. Right. And it's funny when you dig into it, and this is true historically, I think it's probably mostly true of Christian leaders, although I don't want to, I don't want to paint that brush too broadly. When you look into the lives of, of great men, if you dig below the surface beyond what they just did that made them famous, you find they're not good men. Hmm. <laughs> they're just not. They, most of them very abusive of others, uh, tyrannical, used their power, lorded their power over others, hmm. um, just not kind people. Um, and I think that's, that's probably true in some Christian circles as well. These guys that, be, that get this power, that get this influence, if you dig deep, you'll find out that there are issues. Because if you're willing to compromise in what you'll say, for that power and influence, what else are you willing to compromise on mm -hmm. in your life? There's, it's just a lack of integrity. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if you dig deeper, you're going to find those things. Yeah. Because that's what, that, that's just human nature. It's who we are. There, there's an interesting part of that where when you, when you seek popularity, when you seek power and influence, it has to be very lonely because you're sacrificing a mm. lot to get there. Yeah. And you create structures around you that shield you from people. Yeah. I mean, the questions that I would ask about celebrity, um, maybe celebrity is a bad word here, but popular, uh, Christian leaders. So mm. Christian leaders that have a platform of some kind. My question is always who's surrounding them. That's going to help them live out the one another's who's surrounding them. Right. That's going to hold humble. them accountable yeah. Yeah. for how they live And the th same things you're talking about. Who's going to hold them accountable for being tyrannical. Yeah. Who's going to help put them in check when they're being a jerk. Right. Who's going to love them enough to give them hard words at the right time. Right. To help them go the right way. Yeah. We need that, that God has instituted the one another's he's instituted us within the body to that end. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good thing. And it's a grace in the local church that we get to live that way so that we don't go off the rails. There's stories after stories of Christian leaders, pastors, preachers, you know, celebrities that literally go, they go through life. They have, everything's handed to them by staff, by, by assistants. Mm. Uh, they're limousined all around. Here, here's your talking points. They read it, it and, and they call themselves pastors. Yeah. And yet they don't know anyone. There's nobody to hold them in check. Like you said, they're, they're like yeah. the celebrity that is constantly being catered to. And so they, they bounce around on the, on the speaker circuit mm -hmm. and they get paid big money to write books. Then they don't write the books. They get other people to write chapters and they put their name on the book. For those of you listening out there, I don't, I hate to be this cynical, but you have to have your eyes open, right? Mm. To what's really going on out there with this type of culture. And that's why we're big. We are just massive fans of small local church. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, it, it is, you know, you bring up those points and it's crazy how, yeah, I didn't know any of that when I was younger. It's just right. like, oh, they're an author and they're a pastor. That's so great. Right. And then you start, you go to some conferences and you see the game and then they start promoting more conferences and you start seeing, oh, wh when are they at their church? Right. Right. When they're writing a lot yeah. and they're speaking a lot. Right. When are they shepherding? When right. are they involved with their people? Right. What does that look like? Mm. And then when are their people involved with them? Yeah. And, and so the rough party is even with a lot of these Christian leaders and it's unfortunate, you know, we're not trying to talk about them just to defame people or to, to slander anyone, right. but they're in the public. And because of that, and then having a public platform, it opens them up to public scrutiny. Yes. It opens them up to public observation. Yeah. So they're no longer in the realm of, Hey, you don't know him. Don't say anything. Now they put themselves at that place and said things publicly to the ether, just mm -hmm. wide open, mm -hmm. not to a targeted group of people. Paul wrote to a targeted group of people in time and space. And yes, we're beneficial. We benefit of that mm -hmm. today. And we know that he's writing to the universal church as well, but he still wrote to specific people. Yeah. These popular Christians in media they often just blah and they just want it to go out and hit whoever it hits. And they, there's no concept right. of them speaking specifically to people, which is really anti God. Right. God is very specific in his direction. Yeah. These Christian leaders often don't do that. And this is what makes it difficult. So now we're naming some names. We've named some already. We'll name more by this episode. We'll name more next episode. <laughs> the, the, it's just going to happen. Not because we're trying to be mean, right. but the nature is public ministry gets yeah. public rebuke at times. Yeah. And so sure. in this, this is a rub where they've let it out and mm. they're speaking. And we're not just saying, oh, this pastor said this at his church. Mm. 
were saying, yeah, they put it out there in public. They wrote an article yeah. to anyone and now it might need to be corrected. Yeah. And they can, they, they, they can often wrap uh, the way they do things in, in biblical terms. That's the, uh, that's the kind of scary thing too. Cause uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put another name out there. Carl Lentz mm. is a cautionary tale for anybody who wants to grow, wants to go into ministry and wants to build a big platform. This is a guy that Hillsong, New York city, uh, one of the fastest growing churches in America, um, absolute train wreck. Mm. He's exactly the guy that I just described where everything is handed to him and his, he gets up there on Sunday and uses his charisma and his looks mm -hmm. to draw a massive audience and it just pumps up his ego, right? And anybody that looked at that guy and, and watched the way he operated, every one of us looked at it and said, he's going for a fall. Mm. It's coming. And I still see these guys. I still see clips on social media and I look at it and go, it's just a matter of time. Mm. I, there, you know, I watched a guy this last week and you know, I'm, I'm looking at him, super good looking guy, sp must spend six days a week in the gym, mm. wearing a shirt that's too small. Mm -hmm. He's up there bouncing around the stage, doing like a Ted talk, but applying script yeah. by the Bible to yeah. it. And I'm looking at it going, it's just a matter of time. There's something going on there, right? Yeah. But boy, he's a celebrity. People just flock to him. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah, he's because building his image. Yeah, it, it's a show at that point. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's not for what he's saying. Right. It's how he's saying it. Absolutely. It's how people feel when they receive it. Yep. It's not the truth. It's not the actual message. Yeah, you know, I think. On the, so, if we were to look at two kind of extremes on this popularity spectrum, there's that one that you just described. Yeah. The guys who are working out all the time, practicing MMA, which you're like, as a pastor, do you really? Come anyways, on now. you don't yeah. get anyone in a headlock. <laughs> but I mean, at least as far as I've seen, uh, maybe some good benefit from that. Um, but they're working out, they're focused on the fancy clothes, you know, they're yeah. wearing Gucci and oh, all these yeah. other things. The sneakers this guy had on were amazing. <laughs> yeah. He's designers, you know, yeah. $500 sneakers. Yeah. Right. Preachers and sneakers right. was the thing right. we talked about a couple right. of years ago. Right. So there's that, I think there's that extreme on one side. I think the other extreme or another extreme, uh, for this popularity is that intellectual focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we have the kind of the looks and the appearances side, then there's this, this intellectualism, this excitement to engage with people, uh, just purely on an intellect basis, right, right. not, not a matter of what's in God's word, right. but it's how you can come across and how you can posit thoughts, yeah. how you can just offer, how well, have you thought about this kind of that armchair theologian, but yeah. not really a theologian, more of just an armchair thinker. Uh, and I think that's been, you mentioned Tim Keller. I'm not going to try to pick on him and to be a mean way, but I think he really had that, that niche. Um, and especially right. in a lot of his articles, he had that respect of the secular unbeliever yes. and they loved him or respected him because of that intellect, mm -hmm. because of the ability to reason and other kinds of things. Um, but not necessarily because he was biblical. Right. Right, exactly. I'm, and I don't say that to yeah. be mean. I yeah, just, yeah. I mean, again, and I'm going to—I'll defend him for a second. He's written some good stuff in the past. I mean, really biblical, solid. I've stuff. used his stuff. Yeah, the meaning of marriage is a book that I've used uh, in in uh, premarital counseling. It's a great book. And so, yeah. But after a while, you know, again, here's a guy who planted a church in New York City and an urban ministry, and he just he just began to see that the most important thing for him was this, this winsome technique of drawing people in, but once you draw them in, what do you do with them? Right. Mm -hmm. And that, and it became more about the cultural sensation mm. than it became about biblical teaching. Yeah. Right. Because look, we can be honest, if you're going to, if you're going to dig in and do expository preaching, like we do at Oak, <laughs> you know, it's not going to draw everybody. No, it's just not, no. you, you just, it's not the popular message. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But there are, you're right. There's a lot of guys and they'll write books and books and books about, you know, new church practices, new techniques, new methods, all these things to try to grow a church and attract attention and all that. And, and people, again, every young pastor out there is like, I want to grow a big church. I want to grow a big church. So they'll read all the books, read all the books, try all the techniques and, and after a while, you're just like, you know, you could just preach the Bible. Mm. <laughs> you could try that. So anyway, um, look, you know, we, we can go on and on about this, right? Yeah, there's there's so much that could be said <laughs> and, about and, it. And I don't want this to be self-serving, like, oh, we've got it all figured right, out. Right, right, right. That's the thing. We're just, because we made a lot of mistakes in the 17 of years we've been and around. We'll and we'll keep making them is we the will. thing. Right, we will not be right. perfect. But we're going to keep coming back to that idea that the, that the word it is Amen. at the center of everything. Amen. So. so let's give some principles then for the, the Christian listeners out there who are, who are wondering, how do I think then 
about these popular Christian leaders because we don't want to yeah. do, you know, you just gave, uh, I think, a fair defense of Tim Keller. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right, right. And, and we can still choose, like we can still choose whether we do want to read something from them or not. Like right. that, there's freedom there. Right. But we don't need to just say, ooh, anything they ever wrote, we're going right. to throw it away. Right. And, and if you read it, then somehow, you know, we're, you're, you're not sound anymore because yeah. you appreciate it. So we don't want to go down that I think that's trail. A, I think you should pause there. That's a, that is, we see that in our tribe, if you want to call what we, how we see church life in our tribe, that's probably one of the bigger negative trends that I see mm. guys that are like, okay. And, and this happened to Alistair Begg mm. just mm-hmm. recently. And he's, that's a ministry that I've loved mm. and, and benefited from personally. And he said something controversial mm-hmm. about a year and a half ago. Yeah. And it was like half of our tribe decided he was a heretic. Mm. He is persona non grata. And I'm like, whoa, hold on a second. First of all, what he said, I thought I thought he defended it well, even if I know degree, I thought he defended it well. But how are we throwing out a guy with a 50 year ministry mm. because he made that one comment? So we just, we gotta be careful. We gotta be objective. Yeah. And and yes, it is true that men go through seasons of life, and at one point you may you may say, you know what, I loved everything he did. I I can think of a a ton of guys like mm-hmm. this. Early on, I love what he did. Later on, not so much. Yeah. But I can be objective and say that book he wrote twenty years ago. It's a really solid book. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I think I think that's helpful. Yeah. And a good distinction. We we do tend in at least in our theological circle in our bubble, as we often right. call it. We tend to be very judgmental, yeah. and sometimes it stems from from a heart of wanting to limit unhelpful voices. And so, I can appreciate mm. the desire sure. to not let a little leaven, like we were just talking right. about, leaven the whole lump. Right. So, I can appreciate that. And and to that end, I would say then for the weaker brother, for somebody who doesn't have that level of discernment, we were talking earlier about the need for discernment. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah, maybe maybe just stick to the word. Maybe don't even right. make it about an author right. or any author, not just which author do you listen to. Focus on the word first. For for the person who is exercising discernment, working on it, these are the principles, and we're going to talk about them in a second, that are going to help in this process of saying, okay, how do I tell between something that I just got to say, you know what, eh, I'll pass on that, yeah. versus, hey, that challenged me. Maybe I don't agree with everything, yeah. but this can be helpful and can help push me towards Christ, Right, can help me go in the right direction. And I think if, if we were to really broad brushstroke Christian authors across history, mm-hmm. I would say <laughs> there's probably a lot that are completely unhelpful. Yes. There's a lot of books that are out there on like spirituality, essentially, oh my goodness, yeah. and mysticism. So we can't even say that all the authors are amazing. I mean, in today's day and age, you can go on Amazon and make your own book. Right. So, I mean, it, there's a lot of garbage out there. So if, big if, picture. If you go to Barnes and Noble. Oh, it's going to be a train wreck. I mean, it's going to yeah. be one out of a hundred books in there. Maybe. maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I'm, it, I'm, and they're in the Christianity section. Yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah. And you'll right. find Hinduism and Buddhism. Oh you'll find goodness. all kinds of things yeah. in there. Yeah. So there's a lot of garbage that's out there. Now, if we narrow in the scope to say, mm-hmm. okay, what about evangelical Christian authors, things that you might find in like a, I don't know, Crossway, Lifeway, which right. I don't agree with all their all their products that are there, but something like that, mm-hmm. that kind of Christian bookstore mm-hmm. kind of dynamic. Again, in there, you're still going to find uh, a portion of those books that are going to be somewhat unhelpful, uh, where maybe even downright dangerous at times, depending mm-hmm. if it hasn't been vetted and, and who and who wrote it. But there's going to be this section of books that, you know, whether it's you and I or another, we'll say another popular Christian leader, just to throw that out there for funsies, mm-hmm. may recommend and say, hey, go, that book can be helpful. That book can be a blessing. Even giving that endorsement doesn't mean that everything that they wrote was 100% great, right. nor does it mean that their life was perfect and awesome. Right. Because we, as Christians, I think it's important for, for Christians to hear this, we trust God's word, number one. Mm-hmm. God's word without flaw, God's word without error, that's what we trust. People right. can mess up. Right. People aren't going to get it right. I mean, you and I know when, when we're teaching publicly, not every word's going to come out. We joke sometimes. You're, yeah. <laughs> if something comes out on a Sunday, you're like, oh man, I didn't mean to say that. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> you know, right. you know, Alex, scrub the tape. Yeah. Uh, you know, something like that. It, it happens. Not everything's going to be 100%. Alistair yeah. Begg, great example. Yeah. You don't throw out everything he's ever said just because you may disagree on one component with him. You, you're allowed to disagree. Does that mean that he's wrong on everything else? Right. If he's yeah. right on something, he's right on something. If exactly. Tim Keller's right, right on something, right. he's right on something. Right. Correct. And if he's wrong on something, he's wrong on something. Right. We need to grow in our ability to discern the difference. Yeah. And so I think a, that's the big issue. Yeah. Be a Berean. 
Yeah. Right? The, the big issue, even for loving popular teachers, I think is we want people to spoon feed us baby food yeah. instead of wanting to grow up and eat mature food. Yeah. And I, and I think, I, I think right now in the, in the age we live in, I think you have to, you almost have to start f- with your guard up. Yeah. Before you listen or read mm-hmm. anything right now. You don't now. take everything in. You yeah. start very restricted. Yeah. yeah. And so you start with your guard up and say, I'm going to be really careful here because, yeah, because so much of it is watered down or liberal. Some of it is even, you see things called Christian and it's tinged with strange things, a little uh, Catholicism thrown in. Yeah. The, the Christian label has gotten mm-hmm. broadened out so much that, it's, that you're not even really sure. So yeah, just have your guard up and, mm-hmm. and, and weigh it carefully. And if something... If a red flag goes up in your mind where you're like, that doesn't sound right, then it may not be right. So check it out. Do, you know, this is a good opportunity to dive into the word, be a Berean. And if you have questions, reach out to an elder or somebody and say, hey, I read this. Does, is this right or wrong? Yeah. You know? and, and I think that point right there about going to local church leaders yeah. is probably the number one encouragement we could give yep. to any listener. And that's not just because, you know, we're focused on Oak Hill, but if you are at a local church and you have real leaders there, they're not virtual leaders, they're not, you know, site leaders, the real church leaders mm-hmm. as God has instituted, that you would go to them, that you would know their lives and that they would know yeah. you. That's the goal. That's the way that that God has orchestrated all of this to work. That's when things are working in order. They're out of order when the person who doesn't know the leader listens to a leader that they don't know and that doesn't know them. Right. That's when things get dangerous because now it's not personal. Right. That relationship, there's no intention there. So there's a huge grace of being able to know your leaders. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right. You have to know Paul to imitate him. That's right. You can't just say, oh, well, you know, I heard about Paul. Yeah. You know, I think I should do this. Think about how hard it is to really know people. Um, it, it's to some extent you can know Adam Sanchez or, or Jeff No. Uh, people in our local church definitely do. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I show up um, in people's homes and I'm not. I'm just being. I'm just Jeff. Mm-hmm. And and you can see you can see my marriage. You know my kids. Um, you see, uh, you know, how I, res- if so somebody in compliments me, you see how I respond mm-hmm. to that. You see, hopefully how I treat my fellow believers or mm-hmm. treat my fellow staff. That makes a huge difference. You watch yeah. even a guy that you might trust. You're like, I just, I just read this thing from John Piper. Great. You actually don't know John Piper, right? You have no idea really what his marriage is like. Right. I hope, I'm sure it's fine. We, we pray like <laughs> right. we pray it is. Right. But yeah. you don't know. You don't know. Um, him. And so, yes, that's why at the end of the day, the, your local church leaders got people you, you are, you're rubbing elbows with and you're, you're living life together with them. That's going to be your best source mm-hmm. of, and you know what? You can come up and ask us questions. We, yeah. that's one of the things that we are really, you know, we really value that at Oak Hill to say, come talk to me. Mm-hmm. I, I had a member uh, recently, right after the end of service, ran up to me and he said, I have a question. We sang this particular worship song and there was this one lyric in there and I wanted your opinion on it. I was like, that's a great question. And so we dialogued about that. And I think we both walked away edified by that mm. conversation. You can't do that with John Piper when you read his book. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Which doesn't mean the book might not be helpful, but right, right. you can't know him in that way. And I think that's the, the key principle here right. is as believers, we really should weigh the voices of our, of our local church leaders we should weigh those heavier mm-hmm. than we weigh the voices of the authors and the popular Christian leaders. It doesn't mean that they're right. evil. It doesn't mean that the popular Christian leaders are bad, but we should weigh the lives of those who we've seen, right. the lives of those that, that we've witnessed them. We've seen their testimony. We see their character. Those voices should be weighted heavier in our hearts and minds yes. than the voice, the more impersonal voices right. that can occur through, I mean, podcasts and, right, and, right. and audio or books and, and audio sermons and other kinds of things. It's one of the key reasons why we, you know, when people say, oh, I, I can be a Christian and just, you know, I can just listen online from home. Mm. And no, you need to know your shepherds. You need that, that, that person who's speaking truth in your life. You should know that person. Yeah. 
And it's again, one of the weaknesses I think of the, of the big churches, you know, you have thousands of people, you as a congregant will never know that guy who's preaching every week. You just, yeah. just numbers wise, you're not going to be able to do mm-hmm. that. And I think that's a weakness in the model, not that it's bad or wicked, but it's just a weakness in the model that you're not going to be able to look at his life. He, he, sli- he goes into the green room mm-hmm. on Sunday. He slides out mm-hmm. onto the big stage. He preaches a message. It might be really solid. You can learn from it. That's great, but you will never know his life. Yeah. Yeah. So that matters. No, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely weigh that heavily. That's a dynamic, and that's right. in our day and age a, a real thing. It is. I mean, you have because even and you look at the big churches that occurred a hundred, two hundred years ago, the pastor didn't have a green room, so right. he may have had you know like Spurgeon may have had a, you know thousands of people uh, that met Tabernacle, but he would walk to the back, yeah, and when people would leave, he would greet every person right. that that's left. Right. That's right. And so that is a very different dynamic yeah. where. There's that FaceTime, he remembers people, he knows people that are in his community. And I'm not saying that that's perfect and that right. that's the the model that we should follow, but it is quite different than what you're describing today right. Right. when we have these kind of real big popular churches uh, where, you know, the pastor's whisked in, you know, with yeah. security and whisked <laughs> out and got handlers and all of that, which it just, it's rough. Yeah. It's a rough dynamic. It really is. So as we're thinking about this, a couple of principles come to my mind and then anything you want to throw in here. Um, when I'm thinking about how the world receives people, so popularity in general, yeah. I'm always wary mm-hmm. because I think about how Jesus taught so often that you, the world's not going to love you because the world didn't love me. John That's what fi- he said. Yeah, John 15. Yeah, and you yeah. heard a guy preach about that. I know. You know <laughs> I think I did. Yeah. <laughs> a little right. while ago. Right. And so we have that reality of if you're loved by the world, red flag, you yeah. know, there, there's a caution that goes up. Yeah. There more than a caution, I think. If right. the world really wants to hear from a believer, there's I'm already nervous there. You know, right. if the world didn't love our master, why would it love us? Right. And you've been chosen out of the world, so the world's not gonna love you. That right. that's that's gonna be pretty pretty normal for us. And we're yeah. called to be light right. in the darkness. Right. Darkness doesn't love light. Men love darkness that's rather right. than light, so they hid. So oh, so many passages come to my mind about not being loved by the world. So whenever somebody's popular in the world, it just makes me, my antenna go up and say, right. whoa, right. let's take it easy here. Let's not just buy hook, line, and sinker right. everything that they're saying. I think second thing I would encourage, and we've talked about this, but the encouragement to cultivate relationships in the local church. It's so important. We just yep. got back from men's retreat, emphasized this dynamic of practicing the one another's. But it's really, you know, as we mentioned, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the mm-hmm. reason Paul can say imitate me is because he's lived life with the Corinthians. Right. He's That's lived right. with them. He That's spent right. time with them. Right. He could say the same thing to the Ephesians. You know, he spent years with them in their yeah. church. And so when, when he says things like, watch my life, imitate me, follow me, he's not saying pridefully, I'm doing everything right. Mm. He's saying, I'm trying to follow Christ and I'm trying to model that. Right. So as I'm modeling that for for the sake of faithfulness, model me as I model him. Right. And we're going to create a generation after generation after generation of followers that are following the king. Yeah. That's the, the pattern that we're in. And so when we think about Christian leaders in the local church, we do want to cultivate those relationships. It's right. not that, you know, you can only build friends with leaders in the church, but definitely try. Yeah, definitely try. That's a good encouragement. And even if you, you don't get to be great friends with a leader because of, you know, your schedules don't line up or different opportunities, but there's other believers too. Yeah. And there's other believers in the church that are also seeking to imitate Christ. So you need those one another's. Yep. That's, that's the, really the main means, uh, you know, of life, sanctif- life on life sanctification that God provides in practicing the one another's. And then you're going to learn from his word when you hear the word proclaimed on Sundays. Right. You're going to grow from, from hearing the word proclaimed and hearing it applied. You're going to be part of, you know, groups that are occurring, small groups, community groups, that kind of thing. Mm. And then you can still read on the side. Mm-hmm. And that's a grace. You mm-hmm. should read on the side. Yeah, be great. For Focus sure. on the word first. But if you get other things too, amen. For sure. All those things will kind of work together. But I think as Christians, we really really should be guarded. I like the word you use. We should be guarded when it comes to, to the media. Yeah. When media is promoting something, even if it's something like gospel coalition, yeah. which I don't want to say is wicked and throw the baby out with the bathwater, though right. there are things that I disagree wholeheartedly and some specific things you might end up talking about here on one of these upcoming episodes. But 
there are some good things in the archives. Yeah. There are some, oh, yeah. some beneficial articles that have been there, but we shouldn't be misled just because something's promoted. Right. Nor should we run to say, well, who, how, what did so-and-so say about this? <laughs> like, well, well right. what did God say about it? Can we right. start there? And then we can say, well, what did, uh, does so-and-so line up with God? Right. <laughs> do right. they line up with what he said? Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound funny to people. It's actually easier to go back to a guy who's dead than mm. a guy who's living mm. in this regard, right? Because because I was thinking as you're talking, I quote Spurgeon. Yeah, I mean, and I you may have noticed I'm quoting him more in the Psalm series because he wrote this he amazing wrote, Treasury yeah. of David, uh, and he he's brilliant. But we know his life. There, there's mm. like there's a whole history to his life to where we we can go back and say what he said here has weight to it because of his in, integrity in his life. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps because the story's sort of been written on him. But that's not always true of, of uh, living living theologians, living pastors. But yeah, just be guarded because not everything is that says Christian is Christian. Manage your expectations in the world when somebody. Oh, sometimes we get carried away. Again, we're so looking for validation. So some athlete hits a home run and points yeah. to the sky, and we get super excited. Oh, he's a Christian. Just manage your expectations on that. So don't start following the guy because he pointed to the sky yeah. as he crossed home plate. We, you don't know him. Mm -hmm. So just be careful not to get carried away. Also, you know, you don't, you don't want to be too cynical, right? Yeah. And you, you don't want to delegitimize <laughs> somebody who's just trying and maybe growing. Right. You know, right, that athlete, right, for example, exactly. who's pointing and, you know, they yeah. may be a baby Christian. There was a whole thing about Justin Bieber at one point, you know, had he come to be a through Carl Lentz, mm. which again, oh boy. Yeah. Uh, but then I hear another thing, like he's doing a worship album. So that's an interesting example. So we can get super excited that a celebrity is a Christian now. Well, okay. We can hope for that. We can pray for that. But when, if it, it let's just say it comes out, then let's, let's do the hard work of looking at it yeah, and listening to it. Does it line up with scripture? Mm -hmm. Be objective. Don't get carried away because he's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. Don't get so cynical that you go, he couldn't be a Christian. Right. 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 Find that balance. Just take a deep breath. Right? Yeah. And be a Berean on things. And I think that points, th that statement right there points to the emphasis. We test everything by God's yes. word. We're not testing it by how we feel about it. Right. We're not testing it by what's popular in the moment. We're saying, hey, does this map on with what's true? Yep. And if so, I can say amen. And if not, hey, I'm moving on to the next thing. <laughs> That's, you know? right. That's right. <laughs> we don't need to deal with that. All right. Do we, do we hit that one hard yeah, enough? Yeah, good stuff. Jeff, has been great taking on this subject with you. We pray this has helped you to renew your minds and reform your hearts. We'll see you next time on The Thinking Tree.